lighten your hearts and majalis with a loud salawat for Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. One of the main qualities of the prophets and messengers of Allah is that they continuously used to sacrifice for the Almighty Allah. They would continuously sacrifice their time, their money, their reputation and respect in the community, and of course even their blood and lives, all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have certain prophets that were killed in the most gruesome of ways. Like Prophet Yahya, who was beheaded in a very, very vicious way. And Zakaria, who was cut in half by a saw while he was hiding in a tree. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our holy prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. It was no different than the previous prophets because his life was all sacrifices and struggles. If you look at the beginning of Rasulullah, his early stages, Rasulullah did not come from a very wealthy family. He was not a wealthy individual. He did not have power, political power. Rasulullah was not considered as an educated person in his tribe. Because he never attended formal school. He was never taught to read and write. And thus, he was not someone outstanding to the people of Arabs. But yet, despite that fact, Rasulullah was able to transform the people of Arabia from idol-worshipping, ruthless barbarians to respectful, noble, muhadeen of Allah, monotheists, who worshipped only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah was able to spread his message to the extent that the Holy Quran says, وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ Until Rasulullah saw a day in which people would come into in groups, they would flock to believe in Islam. They would come in groups, group after group would come to Medina just to embrace Islam, just to tell Rasulullah, we want to become your supporters. We want to become Muslims until the entire Arabian Peninsula became Muslims and Rasulullah was their leader. How was he able to do that? He was able to do that with the sacrifices that he had to make. It didn't come easy. It didn't come free. Allah could have gave it easily to Rasulullah. Just miraculously make Rasulullah succeed and triumphant and make him the king. Could Allah have done that? Of course. But Allah chose not to do that. Allah chose that Rasulullah succeeds naturally through the natural ways and means. And it was because of Rasulullah's sacrifices that he was triumphant in the end. Rasulullah had to flee his hometown of Mecca. He lived in exile in Medina. He was threatened. He was bothered. They waged the Meccans war against him. His family members were tortured. His companions were tortured and killed. Rasulullah and those that were close to him gave so many sacrifices. In the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him succeed. So without sacrificing, without struggling, we cannot succeed, my friends. And there were two individuals that gave the most for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two of Rasulullah's close companions and close family members that sacrificed the most. And if it wasn't for them, there would be no Islam. The Prophet speaks about that. He says in the famous hadith, Buni al Islam ala thnain. He says, Islam was built and established upon two main sacrifices. Number one, Buni al Islam ala Sayfi Ali. Imam Ali was the greatest person that sacrificed. Because in every battlefield, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was the champion and the hero. In every battlefield, he was the one, the courageous, the brave one that used to go in the front line and put his life on the line and fight those great warriors of the Arabs. In every battle, 
Imam Ali alayhi salam was the hero. In every battle, he was the champion. The Sahaba, in any time of distress and weakness, they would seek refuge in Ali. And Ali was the champion. Take, for example, the battle of Khandaq. The Muslims, they had an alliance with the Jews of Bani Quraidha or Qaridha. They were allies. What did the, the Jews do? They went and they betrayed the Muslims and they conspired with the Muslims' enemies, the Mushrikeen of Quraysh. All of a sudden, the Prophet wakes up one day. He sees his allies, the Jews, they have conspired with his enemies, the Meccans, and they have come to fight the Muslims. And they surprised the Muslims. They don't even have time to get ready. So what did the Muslims quickly do? They dug a trench. They dug a trench to give them time until they get ready so the... The enemies don't, can't come to them. There's this trench between them. So they dig this trench, and according to some reports, this trench was two meters deep and six meters wide. So it's very big. No one could cross it. So the mushrikeen, they say, what do we do? There's this big trench. How do we pass it? Until one of their warriors, by the name of Amr ibn Abd al Amri, he says, don't worry, leave it up to me. I have a solution. Now, in order to put, you, put things into context, you have to understand who Amr ibn Abd Wadd al-Amri was. Only then you'll understand how great Imam Ali was. Let me tell you a little about Amr ibn Abd Wadd. Amr ibn Abd Wadd al-Amri was the greatest warrior in the Arabian Peninsula. He was the mightiest, the bravest, the strongest warrior. They say back then, when a mother wanted to put her child to sleep and the child was, would not sleep, he would give his mother trouble, what, she would, what, she, what would she do? She would invoke the name of Amr. She will say, if you don't sleep, Amr will come. That child would shiver and sleep right away. He was a legend. Everyone was afraid of Amr ibn Abdul. That's how big his name was. He was called Faris Yaliyal. He was in an area once called Yaliyal. And what happened in Yaliyal was that an entire tribe, they say, attacked him all of a sudden, attacked him all by himself. How many people in that tribe? Some reports say 50, some reports say 100. So 50 to 100 people, they ambushed him. But he was able to single-handedly defeat all of them. It's like in the Hollywood movies. You know, one person against 50 or 100, and he killed all of them. After that incident, everyone feared Amr. No one would dare fight Amr ibn Abdawud. No one would dare place their eyes in the eyes of Amr ibn Abdawud. That's how mighty he was. So Amr ibn Abdawud says, I have a solution. He goes back and then he charges on his horse. He charges and charges until he leaps. He jumps over the khandaq, over the trench. He gets on the other side. This is how much? Six meters wide. No horseman had ever jumped such a distance. So the mushrikeen, they're amazed at the might, at the strength, at the greatness of Amr. And the Muslims, they're amazed. They were shocked. They were in awe. Their spirits were down the drain. Khalas, this guy's going to defeat us if he's that powerful. Is he even human? So Amr ibn Abdul comes and he just walks back and forth in front of the Muslims. And he begins to taunt them. He tells them, who amongst you will come and fight me? Who amongst you will come one on one and fight me? And then he told them, doesn't your prophet say, whoever kills me, I will go to hell. But whoever I kill, he will go to heaven. Who wants to come and send me to hell? Who wants to come and fight me and I'll send them to heaven? He begins to mock them. Come and I'll send you to heaven. You'll become a shaheed. Why are you guys afraid? If, I, if you get killed, you're a shaheed, you go to heaven. If you kill me, you defeat me. So there's no way you can lose. He taunts them and mocks them, but no one dares to come. Now the Muslims are looking bad. So Rasulullah comes and he tells his ashab, who amongst you will go and fight Amr? وَأَنَا مِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ لَهُ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْجَنَّةِ I will guarantee for him paradise. Now why did Rasulullah say that? Because obviously if you go to fight Amr, there is no other you know, scenario other than Jannah, other than you getting killed. There is no if you win. You're going to get killed, so I will guarantee paradise for you. Go and get killed, and inshallah, you go to Jannah. Who amongst you will go? No one stands. Everyone's shaking, shivering, except, of course, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam. 
Ali ibn Abi Talib stands and he says, Ana ya Rasulullah, I'll go and I'll fight him. Now Rasulullah, he told him, sit down ya Ali. He wanted to give the other companions a chance because later on they'll say he favored his cousin. He told them, sit down Ali. The second time he told them, Man minkum yabruz ila Amr ibn Abdawad wa ana adhmanu lahu ala Allah al-Jannah. Who will go and I imagine Rasulullah, this is the Prophet, the Messenger of God, telling you go and get killed and you'll go to Jannah. What else do you want? You'll be amongst the highest levels of Jannah. Once again, no one dares. All these great Sahaba of Rasulullah, no one dares. There's this awkward silence. No one wants to go and get killed. Once again, Ali says, Ana ya Rasulullah. Now, meanwhile, Amr ibn Abdul is just looking that all these companions are afraid. No one is accepting. So he begins to lose patience. So he starts to mock the Muslims with lines of poetry. This is how much he makes fun of them and mocks them at their, you know, how, uh, you know, how cowards, how, how much, you know, they become cowards and they don't, they're not willing to fight him. So Amr says two lines of poetry. What does he say? أخواني إذا شوي نراعي الهدوء بالخلف رجاء شوي راعوا الهدوء صلوا على محمد وعلي محمد عمر بن عبد الود begins to mock and taunt the Muslims was with two lines of poetry what does he say he says ولقد بححت من النداء بجمعكم هل من مبارز ووقفت إذ جبنا الشجاع مواقف البطل المناجز. He says لقد بححت. I've had enough. I'm tired of calling and calling. Who will fight me? Who will fight me? I'm losing my voice. Come on. Is there anyone brave enough to fight me? Or are you all, you know, afraid? You're cowards. He begins to mock them. I'm getting tired. Come on. So Rasulullah sees this is looking bad on the Muslims. So the Holy Prophet. Once again, the third time, he says, who will go and fight Amr and I will guarantee paradise? For the third time, no one besides Imam Ali. Now that he gave the Sahaba a chance three times, he tells him, go Ya Ali, go and fight him. May Allah protect you. And then the Prophet says these words, Baraza al-Imanu kulluh ila shirki kulluh. He said, when Ali went to fight Amr, the entirety of Iman went to the entirety of Shirk. He didn't say a Mu'min went to a Mushrik. He said Iman went against Shirk because Imam Ali was the embodiment of Iman. Imam Ali went. Now remember, Amr, he mocked the Muslims with lines of poetry. Imam Ali, he, right away, he came back with his own lines of poetry. What did he tell Amr? And this was Amr. No one would dare look at him in his eyes because he'd kill you with one strike. He told Amr, لا تعجلن فقد أتاك مجيب صوتك غير عاجز إني لأرجو أن أقيم عليك نائحة الجنائز من ضربة النجلاء يبقى ذكرها عند الهزائز الله أكبر You know what he told Amr? He told him, be quiet, who will fight me, who will fight me? I will fight you. Don't think that we're afraid. I will fight you. And not only I will fight you, but I will strike a blow. I will, I will strike you with a strike that will kill you and the strike will remain in history. I will make the woman cry for you. I will make history remember the strike of Ali to Amr. Subhanallah, 1400 years after, we are remembering the strike and the fight of Ali. So he mocked him. Amr was shocked. Who is this that speaks to me in this way? Who dares talk to Amr in this way? No one has ever talked to him in that way. He mocks him in this way. And he saw he's a young man, Imam Ali, he was in his 20s in the story. So Amr says, who are you? You talk to me in this way. He told him, Ana Ali ibn Abi Talib. I am Ali, the son of Abu Talib. He told him, Abu Talib is your father? Abu Talib used to be my friend before. So you know what? I don't want to kill you because I used to love your father and he was my friend. For the sake of your father, I will spare you. Even though you mocked me and I should kill you. But you know what? Go, I don't want to kill you. You know what Imam Ali tells him? He tells him, you don't want to kill me, but I do want to kill you. He keeps on mocking him. So Amr is getting crazy now. Who's this young man that dares to talk to Amr in this way? So Amr, he wants to fight. He's on his horse. Imam Ali has no horse. So Imam Ali tells him, I heard that anytime you fight someone, if, they, if he can give you two options, and you'll always accept one of the two options. 
He says, yes, that's true. What do you have? He says, I give you one of two options. Number one, you surrender and you come and you join us Muslims and you become a Muslim. So he's mocking him once again. You tell your enemy, come and surrender and be, you know, be a Muslim. So Amr says, never will I do that over my dead body. So he says, fine, what's number two? He says, number two, you're on your horse. Come down and fight me like a man. You can't fight me when you're, you're, you're on your horse and I'm, I have no horse. I'm on the ground. He says, okay. So Amr, he comes down from his horse. He takes a sword. Imam Ali takes a sword. And one of the greatest combats of all time happened between Imam Ali and um, the Muslims are watching, they're praying for Imam Ali, the Mushriks are watching. Imam Ali fought like a lion, like a hero. Until Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he took his sword and he struck it on the head of Amr. The ahadith state that he split the head of Amr in two pieces. This is how mighty Imam Ali was. And remember, Amr's body was probably three times larger than Imam Ali, his size. But Imam Ali with one strike, he completely defeated Amr. The Muslims began to cry, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, we have prevailed. <clears throat> this is when Rasulullah cried out. He said those famous lines about Imam Ali. He said, He said the strike, one deed of Imam Ali, which was the strike of Imam Ali on the day of Khandaq, it's greater than the entire worship of all human beings and jinns. Can you imagine? Every human being and jinn, their entire life, they worship Allah. One strike of Imam Ali is greater than that. You know why? Because if it wasn't for that strike, there would be no Islam. We wouldn't be Muslims now. Because Amr would have killed all the companions and Islam would have finished, terminated. It was Imam Ali that kept Islam living till this day. It was because of his sacrifices and hard work and struggles that now we, the Shia of Imam Ali, have the honor to remember Imam Ali and to follow in the footsteps of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam So the first sacrifice that the Holy Prophet made was Imam Ali, through Imam Ali alayhi salam and that was through his courage and the sword of Imam Ali. That's number one. Number two, the second sacrifice, the Prophet says Islam would not spread except through two. The second sacrifice was Mal Khadija. Buni al Islam ala Sayfi Ali and wa Mali Khadija. The money, the wealth of his wife Khadija. Khadija was a very wealthy woman. Based on today's standards, she would be a multi millionaire. She was very wealthy. When she married Rasulullah and Rasulullah was inviting people to religion, you need money, of course. You can't have a movement. You can't have a religion spread without money. You need a masjid. You need to help people. You, ha you have all this, these logistical um, um, expenses. So Rasulullah needed money, lots of money. You have times of war. You need weapons. You need camels and horses and so on and so forth. Khadija gave all her wealth to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She gave and gave and gave until you know what happened to Khadija? When Khadija died, she, had, she did not have a single penny left. They wanted to buy her the kafan. There was not enough money for kafan. Kafan is worthless. It's not expensive. She gave her millions, her hundreds of millions, all for Rasulullah. And it was through... That, that Rasulullah was able to spread the teachings. So Rasulullah and his companions and Imam Ali and Khadija, they sacrificed and sacrificed. Only then they prevailed. The lesson that we learn, my friends, without sacrificing, without struggling, without giving what we love, which is our life, our blood, our money, we can never achieve anything. We can never succeed. Now this is 1400 years ago. Now let's come to today, modern day life. Islam, alhamdulillah, has spread all across the world. But specifically in this part of the world here in North America, Islam is struggling, my friends. Islam faces many complications. Islam has many challenges. We Muslims have many challenges. Just down the border here, you see the Islamophobia and the anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim rhetoric that's increasing every single day. <clears throat> And it's because these people are ignorant. They don't know about Islam. There's so many misconceptions. They're brainwashed to believe that Muslims are terrorists. And the only Islam that they see is the Islam of Wahhabis. The Islam of Saudi Arabia. 
the Islam that knows nothing but beheadings and killings and terrorism and, and, and violence. If I were a non-Muslim, I probably would hate Islam too because Islam to me is the Islam of Wahhabis. Have they heard about the Islam of Ahlul Bayt? Wallahi, they have not. They have no clue who Imam Ali is. They have no clue who Imam Hussein is. They have never heard the sacrifices, the love, the mercy, the peace of Imam Hussein, Imam Ali, and the rest of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. I ask you, who's supposed to teach them? Fox News? Or CNN? Or CBC? Who's supposed to teach them? They're not going to teach them the Islam of Ahlul Bayt. It is you and me, brothers and sisters. It is the obligation of every single one of us to teach them. All of us, we are ambassadors for Islam. Allah brought us to this country. He gave us wealth. He gave us prosperity. He gave us health. He gave us education. What did we do in return when we saw our religion? When we saw our religion is hijacked and people don't know anything about it. Did we just go about our lives or we tried to help our religion? Can I please request the brothers to all stand and come closer to the minbar so we can create room in the back. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Please come as close as you can. Stick to the minbar so we don't do it a second time, please. Come more until you reach the minbar. Thaniyatan ala hubb al hassani wal Hussein. الثالث على حب أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام Who's supposed to teach these people my friends? It's us, it's our obligation. We have to tell them. We have to teach them. The Prophet says every single one of us has a duty to teach people about Islam. To educate people. And that process, my friends, it begins here. It begins in your masajid. It begins in your Islamic centers, in your Husayniyat. This is where we come and we gather and we learn. If we want our youth to learn about their religion, this is where they have to come. This is where they come to learn about Ahlul Bayt, to learn about Islam. You know how many dangers there are in the Western society. If you leave your child, your son, your daughter, where will they go on the weeknights? Where will they go on the weekends? In the weekends here, if you're an average teenager or you're a young person and you're, you know, beginning your early 20s, how do you spend your weekends? You spend it in the bars and clubbing. This is how an average Canadian American spends their time. If we don't support our masajid, our Husseiniyat, don't be surprised if your son one day you find out he's in the bars, if your daughter's in the bars. This is how this society is. You put them in this society, that's how they're going to be. If we don't encourage them to come to these programs, and mashallah, they have a weekly program, I think, throughout the year. And it's during the weekends. If they don't come here, they'll be lost, brothers and sisters. We shouldn't be amazed. We shouldn't be shocked. I have hundreds of stories for you. The most pious of parents, but their children were lost. Because the masjid, the local masjid, the local Husseiniya did not cater to them. Because the parents did not support their Husseiniyat and masajid. They were just busy, busy with dunya, 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 business, business, money, money. That's all we love. What about our children? What about the Iman of our children? Where are they going to learn? Where do they come to learn about Imam Ali, Imam Hussein? If one day someone comes to your child and he tells you, your Quran is filled with violence, does my child know how to answer? They don't. If they tell them, why do you wear hijab? This is oppression. Do they know how to answer? Most they don't because they don't learn the answers. If they tell me Islam is a religion of terrorism, how do I answer? This should be the goal of our masajid, our Husseiniyat, so that we bring the youth and we teach them. Every one of us could be an ambassador, a teacher. We go and we teach non-Muslims about our religion. We do it indirectly through our actions. And that's why, my friends, <clears throat> we said that Rasulullah, he benefited from two main sacrifices. Number one, the blood of Imam Ali, he would put his life on the line. And number two, the money of Khadija. Now, alhamdulillah, no one's asking you to give your life to, you know, to carry a sword and go and fight. No one's asking for your blood. But however, the best way we can support our religion is what? Financially. Support your masjid, your Husseiniya financially, my friends. This is the least we can do for Islam. Khadija gave every single penny for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We can't, you can't have these majalis and these programs, of course, without the proper funding. You know that th this masjid and this Islamic center, this Husseiniya, whatever you call it, it's not funded by any, you know, government. It's not funded by any marja. 
This is all funded by you, the community. It's because of your generosity that we have these programs every week, every month, every year. If you don't support it, who will support it? You want the Christians to come and donate for you so your kids can know how to pray and fast and know who Imam Ali is, Imam Hussein is? You have to support your own selves, brothers and sisters. And I'm sure you're all aware tonight they have a fundraiser ready for you. And I ask you, brothers and sisters, to donate gener generously. You're a very generous community. And every penny that you spend, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you hundreds of times more. In, in one tradition, the Prophet has been narrated saying, whoever gives one dirham, man a'ta dirhaman fi sabilillah, a'tahu Allah bithalika sab'amma'at hasana. You give one dirham, one dollar, Allah multiplies it by 700 times. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran. By 700 times. And remember, tonight is Laylatul Qadr. Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shahr. It's better than how many nights? It's be better than 30,000 nights, 1,000 months. So if you give one dollar tonight, fi sabilillah, Allah will multiply by 700 as Rasulullah said. Because it's Laylatul Qadr, multiply it by another 30,000. The ajr is mind boggling. And that's just the ajr, not to mention, you know, that we will benefit from it. Our children, our youth will benefit from such areas, such venues. So donate generously. Support your religion, support Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali gave everything he had for Islam. Throughout his life, he would sacrifice his life for Rasulullah, for Islam, until finally he gave his holy blood. He was struck when he was reciting salah in his mihrab. Imam Ali gave everything he had for Allah. What did we do, my friend? The least thing we can do is to help and support this masjid financially. Tonight, that will begin, inshallah, shortly, is the 21st night of Ramadan. It's one of the three Layali al Qadr, and thus it's a very holy night, but it's also a very sad night because it is the night that Imam Ali, alayhi salam, with all of his greatness and might, and all of his sacrifices and knowledge and wisdom. It is this night that Imam Ali departed this world. And he left his family members. He left his companions. He left them with pain and agony. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam was struggling on a night like this. Because the poison had gotten deeper and deeper in his head. He knew there was only a few moments left before the Imam will depart this world. So the Imam alayhi salam, he gathered his family members, he gathered his children so that he would tell them the final wasaya, the final wills. He gathered Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, he began with them and I wanna read you some of the wills of Imam Ali. <clears throat> he told them, <clears throat> أوصيكما بتقوى الله وألا تبغي الدنيا وإن بغتكما ولا تأسفا على شيء من الدنيا زوي عنكما وقولا بالحق وعملا للأجر وكونا للظالم خصما وللمظلوم عونا he told them, my dear sons, Hassan and Hussein, fear Allah and never seek the dunya, even if the dunya seeks you. Never be sad or upset if you are deprived any of the ruins of the dunya. Always stand for the truth, work for your akhirah, defend the oppressed and stand against the oppressors. Then the Imam gathered his children and he told them again, Usikuma wa jami'a ahli wa waladi wa man balagahu kitabi bitaqwa Allah wa nazmi amrikum 
وأصلاح ذات البين فإني سمعت جدكما رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يقول إصلاح ذات البين أفضل من عامة الصلاة والصيام He told them once again to fear Allah and the Imam said that these are my wills for my children my family members and all that hear this will meaning the Shia of Ali these are the wills of Imam Ali the final wills of your master he said them in these moments fear Allah and always strive for reconciliation try your best to reconcile between the mu'mineen and then he said that he heard Rasulullah say whoever reconciles between two then that is greater than salah and zakat <clears throat> Then the Imam continued, Allah, Allah, fil aytam, fala tughibbu afwahahum wa la yudayya'u bi hadratikum. He told them to take care of the orphans after me. Do not neglect them, do not abandon them after me. Imam Ali was the caretaker of the orphans, and even in those final moments, he was worried about the orphans. And then he said, Allah, Allah, في الصلاة فإنها عمود دينكم be careful of your salah be mindful of your salah do not neglect your prayer I tell all the young ones who are struggling with their prayers the last will of Imam Ali was to not neglect your prayers if you truly are a lover of Imam Ali if you truly are a Shia of Imam Ali then always take care of your salah your prayers because it is the pillar of of your religion Allah Allah fil Quran fala yasbiqannakum ila al-amali bihi ghayrukum always be mindful of the Quran read the Quran learn the meanings of the Quran follow the Quran and ask the Quran Allah Allah fi bayti rabbikum Allah Allah fi dhurriyati nabiyyikum Allah Allah fil jihad Allah Allah fil amr bil ma'ruf wa the Imam told them their wajibat and obligations of their faith. Then the Imam fell unconscious. Imam Hassan alayhi salam came to his father. He held the head of his father. He placed it in his lap and he began to incessantly cry and weep. The Imam was unconscious. Some of the tears of Imam Hassan fell on the face of Amir al the Imam gained conscience back. He saw Imam Hassan is crying, he is weeping, he is wailing for his father. He told him, Waladi Hassan, Atajza'u ala abik wa anta ghadan masmoom, mazloom, maqtool. He told him, My dear son Hassan, you cry for me now, but in a few years you will also be killed, you will be poisoned to death and then he turned to Imam Hussein Sayyidu Shuhada he told him as for you Hussein there is no musibah like the musibah of Hussein he told him what will happen to him in Karbala he told him you will be killed with the sword while you are thirsty in Karbala between the enemies Allahu Akbar on top of all of the pain the Imam is in he's worried about Imam Hassan, he's worried about Imam Hussein, and this is how Fatima alayhi salam is. She cries for Hassan, she cries for Hussein. Allahu Akbar, the poet says, Hanoh ya Zahra ala manhut nohin, nohaj ala al masmoom, la nohaj ala Hussein. Oh, Fatima, do you cry for Hassan or do you cry for Hussein? Hussein because each one has his own musibah. 
After that, Zainab السلام, came inside. Zainab and Umm Kulthum, they came to farewell their father. They know there's only a few minutes they have with Amir al Mu'mineen. Zainab came and she cried and she said, ومن للكبير بين الملاء أبتا حزننا عليك طويل وعبرتنا لا ترقى My dear father if you leave us who do we turn to after you يا أمير المؤمنين our, our agony and our grief will be eternal we will never forget you and then she tells her father, My dear father, I heard Ummu Ayman, she told me about Karbala, Haddathatni Ummu Ayman bi hadithi Karbala, wa ahbabt an asma'ahu mink, I wanted to hear it from you, what happens to Karbala. Amir al Mu'mineen tells her, Naam ya bunayya in al hadith kama haddathatki Ummu Zainak Ummu Ayman, and then he tells her, Ka'anni biki wa binisa ahliki fi hadha al balad sabaya. خاشعين تخافون أن يتخطفكم الناس فصبرا صبرا زينب you have to be patient my daughter Zainab because a day will come I won't be there your brother Hassan won't be there your brother Hussein won't be there Abbas won't be there you're all alone with just orphans and widows they will take you as prisoner of war they will treat you like like a slave they will beat you they will insult you so please have patience my dear daughter Zainab Zainab Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam then knows that it is time to depart this world. Ya Azza alaykum ya Mu'mineen. Amir al Mu'mineen falls on conscience and then he wakes up and he says, I saw Rasulullah. هذا رسول الله وعمي وأخي جعفر كلهم يقولون أسرع إلينا يا علي فإنا مشتاقون إليك We are waiting for you أو علي Hurry, hurry, we are waiting for you Then Zainab عليه السلام She noticed that Imam Ali was sweating She tells her, my dear father, why are you sweating? He tells her, Ya Bunay, inni sami'tu jaddaki Rasul Allah yaqul, inna al-mu'min idha nazala bihi al-mawt, araqa jabinuh, wa sakana aninuh. He tells her, my daughter, I heard Rasul Allah say that when death approaches a Muslim, a mu'min, he begins to sweat and he calms down. Aywa aliyya, aywa madhul. ثم استقبل إمامكم القبلة ومدد رجلي وأسبل يدي وقال السلام عليكم يا ملائكة ربي لمثل هذا فليعمل العاملون Every one of you should try for this He was looking at الجنة علي السيد that after everything it's worth it because I see Al Jannah now. And then he says, Astaudakum Allah, farewell my family. Allah Khalifati alaykum. Allah will take care of you and protect you. And then the Imam breath is last breath. And the soul departed this world. Aina al Munadi wa Aliya wa Aywa Madhlumaya. 
they did Allah Imam Ali finishes Ramadan they did Allah him to finish his fasting Aywa Aliya Abu Hussein Abu Hussein ma tamma misiyama Abu Hussein ma tamma misiyama siyama lifalid lifalid wa wulada yitama the family of Ali had no Eid. They had no celebration when the Eid came because Imam Ali was not there with them. That's why when Eid came, it's as if they told the Eid. Eid يا الله نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله